Welcome to this maiden presentation of a series of the Pope Francis Magisterial Lectures. We are from the Don Bosco School of Theology, and we have as a core value fidelity to the magisterium of the Church. What better way of living out our value than to have a pastoral insight to the many encyclical letters and apostolic exhortations of the Holy Father so that the world, particularly our Filipino society, may come to realize the importance and significance of his concerns. Today we begin his letter on the care for our common home, Laudato Si. Our speaker for today was born in Italy on November 23, 1942. He was ordained priest on April 27, 1974. He became the spiritual director of Don Bosco Makati on July 1974. Then after three years, he was assigned at Don Bosco Mandaluyong where he served as its director for eight years. In 1985, he was appointed as novice master in Don Bosco, Canluba. In 1987, he became provincial superior for eight years before being assigned as director of the seminary in 1993. He stayed and served for a year in very help of Christians Paranaque before he was sent to Papua New Guinea in 1997. He was appointed bishop of Alutao from 2001 to 2010, he became delegate as coadjutor Archbishop of Rabaul in 2011 and served as Archbishop of Rabaul from 2012 until 2020. Archbishop Pamphilo is known as the Island Bishop. In the two dioceses he took care of, namely Alotau and Rabaul, he visited served and assisted the faithful in many ways. He did his best to reach out to the natives by proclaiming the word of God, celebrating the sacraments, and building the Christian community. True to his motto, Duc in Altum, or set out into the deep, some of the provinces there are located in the deepest depths of the jungle and in the highest mountains. The people loved him because he was the only bishop who went to the remote areas where no other archbishop has gone before, not even politicians. The natives admired him because despite him already in his 70s, the rugged terrain did not stop him from visiting them. He truly left an indelible mark in the hearts of the people. Now presently retired, he stays at Don Bosco School of Theology as its resident professor, but his work continues in promoting the importance of taking care of the environment. Brothers and sisters, let us all welcome our speaker for today, Archbishop Francesco Pantin. Okay. Last, uh, on the 24th of May, 2015, Pope Francis, issued his encyclical letter Laudato Si uh, in response to that uh, encyclical letter on the 15th of August 2015 the solemnity of the Mary assuming to heaven I wrote uh, a, a pastoral letter to the people of the Archdiocese of Rabaul on how to implement in practical ways the Laudato Si. And so, I, and so here is the, uh, the content of this pastoral letter. A call to respond to the encyclical letter of Pope Francis Laudato Si on the care of our common home. 
the purpose of this pastoral letter is not to present in details the, late, the latest encyclical letter of Pope Francis on ecology and the care of our common home, but to respond in very practical ways to what the Pope has written. Encyclical letters, apostolic exhortation, and or messages from the Holy Father are not meant to be documents to be published, read, and later forgotten. They are given to us in order to help us orient our lives in the way God wants us to live. In general, the encyclical letter Laudato Si, in English is praise to be you, my Lord, was well received by believers and unbelievers alike. The unhappy ones were mostly big business groups and multinational companies that operate in developing countries, like, of course, at that time I was in Papua New Guinea, but we could also say Philippines or any other developing countries, where they make huge financial gains at the expense of the environment and the local population. At the heart of the Pope's reflection is the question, what kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children who are now growing up? And we need to ask ourselves other pointed questions. What is the purpose of our life on this world? Why are, you, are we here? What is the goal of our work and of all our efforts? What need, what need does the earth have of us? The answers he suggests call for profound changes to political, economic, cultural, and social systems, as well as to our individual lifestyle. Many things have to change course indeed, but it is we, human beings, above all, who need to change. We lack an awareness of our common origin, of our mutual belonging, and of, and of a future to be shared with everyone. Pope Francis wants to impress on everybody that integral ecology is not only care of the natural world, but it also implies justice for the poorest and most vulnerable people. Only by radically reshaping our relationship with God, with our neighbors, and with the natural world, he says, can we hope to tackle the threats facing our planet today. There is an inseparable bond between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. These are all in, eh, connected one with the other. The Bible makes it very clear to us that everything is connected. Concern for the environment thus needs to be joined to a sincere love for our fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of society. We need to strengthen the conviction that we are one single human family. This is a quote from Laudato Si number 52. <clears throat> All believers, but most especially the leaders of the church, must constantly feel challenged to live in a way consonant to their faith and not contradicted by their actions. They need to be encouraged to be ever open to God's grace and to draw constantly from their deepest conviction about, about love justice, and peace. In the Apostolic Exhortation Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis wrote, 
and this is a very interesting quote, huh? I quote, I want a church which is poor and for the poor. We are called to find Christ in them, to lend our voice to their causes, but also to be their friends, to listen to them, to speak for them, and to embrace the mysterious wisdom which God wishes to share with us through them. And so, convinced as we are that the earth is our common home, and all of us are brothers and sisters, we need to ask ourselves, how can we as church, in very practical ways, care for our common home and be a church that is poor and for the poor. Perhaps here I might, I would like to say that when I was reading the, uh, this encyclical letter, I had a piece of paper near me. And as I was reading, I kept on taking notes because there were three main issues confronting me within the Archdiocese of Rabau. And I felt that uh, we needed to, to implement this, this encyclical letter in a very practical way. And so here we are, trusting in God's love and providence. And in the cooperation of believers, the Archdiocese of Rabaul is committed to the followings. And there are three things that I felt we were committed. First, disposing of the land that the church had in Rabaul, especially the large plantation. Disposing it, meaning to say, giving it back to the original landowners. Secondly, starting a housing project for low-income earners. And thirdly, helping achieve a broad consensus in the Sikite Mucus Palm Oil Project in West Pomio. Okay, I'll try to explain these three points. First, disposing of the land of large plantation. And I would like to quote here from the Laudato Si. I quote, whether believers or not, we are agreed today that the earth is essentially a shared inheritance whose fruits are meant to benefit everyone. For believers, this becomes a question of fidelity to the Creator, since God created the world for everyone. This is uh, Laudato Si, number 93. And then there is a quote from St. John Paul II from his encyclical letter, Centesimus Annus, where he says, I forcefully reaffirm the teaching stated that God gave the earth to the whole human race for the sustenance of all its members without excluding or favoring anyone. Centesimus Annus number 31. Now, the church is not against the return of its land to the people. In fact, I am talking now about the Archdiocese of Rabau. In fact, my predecessors have generously given up portions of prime land for free to the people of Rabaul, in a particular place, a place that was called Takubar. At the beginning of the 20th century, Bishop Louis Coupe was the first bishop of Alotau, um, an MSC bishop, gave to the people of Takubar portion 9104 that was called Kanuk, uh, Kuna Kunai land, amounting to 21.2 hectares. Bishop Johannes Hone, MSC also, in the early 70s, gave the, uh, the Le, Le La Rai land, amounting to 74 hectares, uh, to the villages of Palnakaur and Takubar. In 2006, for the common good of the people and upon the request of the provincial government that wanted to prepare sporting facilities for the, 
for the November 2012 grassroots games, Archbishop Karl Hesse was my predecessor, sold to the uh, East New Britain provincial administrator 21.78 hectares of portion 302 Takubar for 1.4 million kina, which is equal to 6 kina 42 per square meter. You must know that this is really prime land, beautiful land. In the same year, 2006, Archbishop Carlesse, MSC, distributed for free to the following wards, Ramale, Bitagali, Blivuan, and Cabaleo, for part of portion 302 amounting to 160 hectares. In 2007, to the Takubar people, he gave portion 4174, amounting to 20 hectares. Finally, in 2011, Again, to the Takubar people, he gave portion, part of portion 302, amounting to 20 hectares. Of course, you, have, you, you can understand that there was quite a lot of land, and this is precious land because you must know that in 1994, in September, there was a twin volcano eruption in Rabaul that destroyed Rabaul, beautiful town. And so the whole the population of Rabaul moved to Kokopo, where there is there was the, the, there were the plantation of the archdiocese, and so those plantations became uh, residential areas and very precious land. So, okay, now <laughs> now is my turn. I am the archbishop. The archdiocese of Rabaul, therefore, is willing to give up its land especially its large plantation at the time, this was 2015, for a minimal price to the people. I have to say here that as the time passed from 2015, by 2017, we decided to return the land for free. Okay, anyway, yet it seems to be, a it, it seems to be difficult to do so. So in other words, as soon as I became Archbishop of Rabaul, I made it clear. I became Archbishop of Rabaul on August 2011, and in October, 7 October, the Feast of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, I wrote, uh, I, I had a press release, when I made it clear that the Church wanted to return the land, a big plantation, big land, uh, to the original landowner. The question, but I said, it, from the very start, it became difficult to do so. Why? Because some people hold on personal interests or on the belief that they are the owners of the land rather than the stewards, and they want to exclude others whose ancestors were living on the same land. So, in other words, there were about four tribes that came to me claiming to be the original landowners. So I said, hey, let us get together. We, the church, is willing to give you the land, but try to agree among yourself. And this has been very, very, very difficult. And so that's why I wrote, as believer, we should not look at the land from the point of view of our tribe or clan, but from the point of view of God who gave the land to all of us, his, uh, his children, Jesus reminded us that we have God as our common father and that this makes us brothers and sisters. This is also a quote from Laudato Si 2228. Once again, <laughs> I appeal to everyone, as the church is willing to share its land with the people, and I repeat, at that time, in 2015, we said for a minimal price, but then we decided let's give it for free because peace has no, has no price. And we decided to return it. I ask individual persons and groups, especially those who claim land at Put Put, those belonging to the Mesu investment at Carlai, and the people of Ramale, Bitagali, Livuan, and Cabaleo to come together as brothers and sisters and to be willing to share their blessing 
and not to be greedy. After all, this is a, a statement in Pigeon, uh, after all, the number one papa ground, meaning to say the first owner of the land, uh, papa ground, uh, God is the first, is the number one papa ground. Uh, because this land and all its resources were in place even before the various groups of people came here. It should be mentioned here that after the volcanic eruption of 1994, Archbishop Carl Hesse, my predecessor, made available additional land at Tacubar for industrial, commercial and residential purposes at very reasonable prices. This was done for two main reasons. Number one, because most businesses that came from Rabaul had lost everything in the volcanic eruption. And secondly, because those enterprises would offer the opportunity to work for many people. Since the emergency is no longer there, because these enterprises, they established themselves very well, at Tacubar, Presently at Tacubar, the Archidiocese is charging rental fees which might be higher than before, but still supportive of small and medium-sized businesses. In addition, the Archidiocese is trying to ensure the priority allocation at CBU is given to local people. In other words, since the, prop, the land belongs to the church, and the, so also because as our Archidiocese, is a big archdiocese. So we needed some resources to run the archdiocese. And that was the, our only, let's call it, our only income. When the church is involved in some financial transaction, it seems that people only consider the advantages that come to the church. In this regard, it is important to remember that as far as Tacubar Industrial Estate and CBU are concerned, the Archdiocese is financially committed to work together with the Urban Council and the provincial government to address the infrastructure issues. Secondly, we cannot carry out the ministry of proclaiming the Word of God, celebrating the sacrament and especially the ministry of charity, education, health and social services without funds. For the information of all, the Catholic Agency in the Archdiocese of Rabaul runs 190 elementary schools, 65 primary schools, five vocational training centers, three secondary schools, two teachers' colleges, and St. Mary's School of Nursing. In addition, the Catholic Agency also runs St. Mary's Hospital at Vunapope, and another nine health centers, while other social services are carried out silently in many of the four of, of our 38 parishes and more than 80 Catholic communities in East New Britain alone. So within the province, everybody acknowledges that what the church is doing. On this note, it is also important for me to inform our Catholic faithful that the Archdiocese of Rabaul after receiving the permission from the Holy See, is in the process of selling East New Britain to the East New Britain Development Corporation the so-called Rapopo Plantation, which is a beautiful plantation, very, uh, very precious land. It will certainly bring to the Archdiocese of Rabaul a substantial amount of money. So, I wanted to make it very clear to the people. I was not hiding anything. <laughs> ah. So, <coughs> obviously selling that plantation to the East New Britain Development Corporation that was the, the working arm of the province, of the provincial government, would have brought a, a substantial amount. It is certainly, uh, it will certainly bring to the Archdiocese of Rabaul a, a, a substantial amount of money in the spirit of transparency and to sustain his pastoral activities, I wish to inform everybody how the Archdiocese intends to use the money. So, the money that we would have received by selling that property, 
half of the amount will go into a trust fund to be managed by the Catholic Bishops' Conference to support all the diocesan seminarians of Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. Why were, you, were we planning to do that? Because that plantation was a coconut plantation. It was a coconut plantation. Now it's practically going to become a residential plantation. So the coconut plantation was supporting the first seminary of the Pacific, not of Papua New Guinea, of the Pacific. And so I, I, I said, in order to keep that tradition, uh, if we sell the, 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 the plantation, half of the amount will go into a trust fund to support the diocesan seminarians of all the dioceses of Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And the other half of, 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 the, of the income will be utilized by the archdiocese for education, health, the new college at uh, Ulapia, that is a college training teachers for the secondary school, our own seminary, and for the building of a new parish church in that very area of the plantation now. So, I made it clear how that money would have been. There were no secrets now. Okay. The second project, starting a housing project for low-income earners. Chapter 4 of the encyclical letter bears the title Integral Ecology. In, the, in it, Pope Francis gives particular attention to the urban environment. Human beings have a great capacity for adaptation and an admirable creativity and generosity is shown by persons and groups who respond to environmental limitation by alleviating the adverse effect of their surroundings and learning to live productively amid disorder and uncertainty. This is a quote from Laudato Si 148. For the Pope, authentic development presupposes an integral improvement in the quality of human life. And this entails considering the setting in, in which people live their life. Again, is a quote from 147. Such as housing, public places like parks and transportation. Pope Francis writes, and I quote, lack of housing is a grave problem in many parts of the world, both in rural areas and in large cities. Not only the poor, but many other members of society as well find it difficult to own a home. Having a home as much, has much to do with a sense of personal dignity and the growth of families. This is a major issue for human ecology. Again, a quote from Laudato Si 152. <clears throat> I... I acknowledge, I said, there is no doubt that in East New Britain province there are obvious signs of economic growth and development. I was coming from another diocese. My first diocese was a Lautau that was a rural, uh, a marine diocese and a rural diocese where people were living of what they were producing. There was those who had some money there were the public officials, teachers, nurses, members of the government or this and that, the rest of the people. Now I went to Rabau and I could see that there was movement there, there was development. Yet, in spite of these clear signs, many people are unable to build their own house, even though they have been working in the urban areas for, for most of their life. People come to town seeking work and because they cannot find suitable accommodation, they establish their own informal settlements. The Archdiocese of Rabau is committed to start a housing project that will benefit its own employees, first of all, and also people who have worked in town for a long time 
and who have and who have proved to be faithful and re, and reliable employees, but were unable to acquire land or build a suitable permanent house. A parallel project for our catechists is also being developed. I develop a, a how kind of a housing project for our own catechists, also for them working for years and years in the diocese and they could hardly uh, possess something. The archdiocese will make available the land at the back of the sports fields for the project and it will be responsible for surveying the land and for funding the infrastructure development such as drainage, roads, water, power work as we cannot get donor assistance for this. The design of a model house that will be solid, comfortable and moderate in price is also being prepared. Criteria for the selection of beneficiaries will have to be drawn up. We foresee the project to develop into three to four stages <laughs> with the hope, that hope, that at the end we may have about 250 houses. That was what I wrote in 2015. Then, as we went on and we started really to start the project, we realized that. So, in the end, we aim at 100. As of now, as today, as, as I am speaking now, there are close to 40 houses. There is already a community. We set up already a community there. In addition to housing, there is also the need to protect those common areas, visual landmarks and urban landscape, which increase our sense of belonging, of rootedness, of feeling at home within a city which includes us and bring us together. Also, this is a quote from Laudato Si 151. In other words, these landmarks that Laudato Si aims there is, are the parks within town where the children can play or this and that. So, we can rightly say that retired Archbishop Karl Hesse anticipated the words of Pope Francis when he made available to the municipality of Cocopo the seafront area of Vunapope to be developed into a public space for people to enjoy the beauty of nature, for relaxation, family gatherings and picnics, Unfortunately, ah, so my predecessor gave that, which is the how the the sea, the sea front. Huh? Uh, he gave it to the municipality. Unfortunately, to date, was 2015, very little has been done, and the sense of disorder and uncertainty still prevails. We urge the municipality of Cocopo to avail of the generous offer made by the Archdiocese of Rabaul for the good of all people who come to the cathedral, to St. Mary's Hospital, and to shop at the various enterprises. Nothing happened. Okay. All right, the third. Helping achieve a broad consensus in the Sikite Mucus Palm Oil Project in West Pomio. Chapter 5 of the encyclical letter addresses the question of what we can do and must do, especially in regards to business ventures and large projects that affect the land. For this to happen, dialogue and action, which would involve individuals and groups, is essential. For example, when large projects affecting land are proposed, and now I quote Laudato Si 146, it is essential to show special care for indigenous communities and their cultural traditions. They should be principal dialogue partners. For them, land is not a commodity, but rather a gift from God and from their ancestors who rest there, a sacred space with which they need to interact if they are to maintain their identity and values." Unquote. This is true, especially in Papua New Guinea, 
where the land belongs to the people and the people belongs to the land. And in the land, there are sacred places for them. Cemeteries, for example, or other places where they believe in some spiritual this and that. As regard to business proposition and, or agreements, Pope Francis has this to say. And then here I made a long quote from Laudato Si, 183, but it's very important. Environmental impact assessment do not come after the drawing up of a business proposition or the proposal of a particular policy, plan, or program. This kind of assessment should be already prepared before. It should be part of the process from the beginning and be carried out in a way which is interdisciplinary, transparent, and free of all economic or political pressure. It should be linked to a study of working condition and possible effect on people's physical and mental health, on the local economy, and on public safety. Economic returns can thus be forecast better in turn now. Economic returns can thus be forecast more realistically, taking into account potential scenarios and the eventual need for further investment to correct possible undesired effect. A consensus could also be reached between the different stakeholders who can offer a variety of approaches, solutions, and alternatives. The local population should have a special place at the table. They are concerned about their own future and that of their children. The participation of the latter also entails being fully informed about such projects and their different risks and possibilities. This includes not just preliminary decision but also various follow-up activities and continuous monitoring. This is again, I repeat, El Laudato Si 183. And Pope Francis add this Laudato Si 185. In, a, in any discussion about a proposed venture, a number of questions need to be asked in order to discern whether or not it will contribute to genuine integral development. What will it accomplish? Why? Where? When? How? For whom? What are the risks? What are the costs? Who will pay those costs? And how? In this discernment, some question must have higher priority. Laudato Si 185. Now, this is my, I was already high, uh, deeply involved because my involvement there began in 2012, 2013. Unfortunately, what Pope Francis is proposing did not happen at the oil palm projects in West Pomio. Of course, they could say, oh, we did not have the encyclical letter as a guide, okay? But this has caused ill feelings, divisions within the communities and even within family unit. Also some violence has taken place. During my visits to our communities of Pomio Dinery, individuals and groups of people repeatedly asked me to speak up for them, to speak on behalf of those with no voice. In other words, they asked the Archbishop to get involved in trying to solve their problems. The issue or issues at hand are not easy to solve, but I have always believed that with goodwill and dialogue, a solution for, for the common good could be possible. By common good, I mean, and I quote from Gaudio, uh, uh, 
Gaudium Spes, that is a Vatican Council document, the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Now, committing oneself to the common good means to make choices in solidarity based on a pro preferential option for the poorest of our brothers and sisters. So, I try my best. I wrote to some political leaders. I have spoken to them. I have met individuals and groups on both sides of the issue. In the end, I have come to the conclusion that the solution can be found in a new lease agreement that even though it comes after the environmental impact has taken place, it could still bring about authentic development and an integral improvement in the quality of human life. The Archdiocese of Rabaul, therefore, is committed to help achieve a broad consensus in the Sikitemukus Palm Oil Project through the renegotiation of the agreement upon which the project is based to ensure equitable benefits by all parties and appropriate environmental protection. We intend to do so through an initial detailed submission to identify the issues with the current list. This will form the basis for drafting a new lease agreement that is transparent and free of all economic and political pressure. Once the agreement is drafted, it will be presented to the local population and explained in all its legal details so that a consensus could be reached for the good of all. I know that it might not be easy to achieve a broad consensus. For this reason, I appeal to everyone to put aside personal interest and think about the good of all, especially of our children. What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us? The Church does not have any other interest than to encourage an, an honest, and here I quote again Laudato Si 188, to encourage an honest and, de and, and open debate so that particular interest or ideologies will not prejudice the common good. And then, as a conclusion of the, of the pastoral letter, I, remind, I, 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 I reminded uh, the Catholic faithful that the Holy Father, uh, precisely in uh, Laudato Si, decided that on the first, the first day of September of every year, it will be a uh, world day of prayer for the care of creation. So I wrote, dear brothers and sisters, let us indeed work together in preparing a better future for our children. The Holy Father, and here uh, the Holy Father, to reaffirm our personal vocation to be stewards of creation, to thank God for the wonderful handiwork which he has entrusted to our care, and to implore his help for the protection of creation, as well as his pardon for the sins committed against the world in which we live, has decided to institute in the Catholic Church the World Day of Prayer for the care of creation, which, beginning this year, that was 2015, is to be celebrated on the 1st September. The, this pastoral letter is released on the Solemnity of the Assumption, 2015. Carried up into heaven, Mary is the mother and queen of all creation. She is a sign and a pledge of our final glorification and the assurance of our final home, heaven. What was granted to Mary will, be also, will also be granted to us. Through her intercession, may we put into practice the teachings of Jesus here on earth so that so as to be made worthy of heaven.